The American Historical Association says, History helps us understand change and how the society we live in came to be. The second reason history is inescapable as a subject of serious study follows closely on the first. The past causes the present, and so the future. Most of us have learned about U.S. and world history in school, but only reading about the past doesn't do it justice. You need something or someone that brings it to life. The emotions felt by those who lived through critical events need to be described so acutely that the listener feels them too. The sensory details and environmental conditions surrounding an event need to be painted like a landscape so that you too feel as if you were a witness to a crucial moment in history. By learning history, one can better understand the human experience in other times and places. Working with Mr. Fiddler and hearing his stories has instilled a sense of pride in me, but also there are times when I feel moments of shame. People my age overlook the service of our elderly. They forget our veterans. We don't often think about the lives lost during war or the mental scars it left on those who bravely served. Their stories and sacrifices cannot be forgotten. For every day that we live freely, they must be remembered. Today, Mr. Fiddler and I will be exploring what it was like to be a part of the final and bloodiest battle of the Pacific Theater in World War II, the invasion and the Battle of Okinawa. Mr. Fiddler, I understand that the USS Loy was underway, escorting a large task force headed north. Where was your ship sailing, and did you know what was in store for you and the crew? Yeah, I can tell you that. March 21st, we were on our way, escorting this large task force heading north. We quickly learned the nature of our operation, the invasion of Okinawa. On March 25th, we arrived off the coast of three small islands, 30 miles west of Okinawa, where mines exploded and kamikaze crisscrossed the sky. At 6.20, Japanese suicide planes attacked us. They hit four following ships, the USS Kimberley, DD-521, the U.S. Gilmore, APD-11, USS Newton, APD-101, and one identified ship. Six Japanese planes splashed down that morning, and one of them fell less than 1,500 yards ahead of us. We experienced two more air raids that night. One was at 1,800 and the other 2330, when three more Japanese planes were shot down near us. Well, that's quite a, gr a welcome. Yeah, I look. <laughs> Not exactly a surprise if we were, after all we heard, we knew what we were going to run into. And uh, the main assault was scheduled for April 1st, or Love Day, in the Navy lingo. Easter Sunday it was. We arrived early so that the UDT could proceed with its business. We remained late in our alternate capacity as an escort or screening vessel, and we screened the island rather than participate in a convoy against submarines and aircraft. How many other ships participated in the first half of this? Well, there were a total of 1,400 ships for the whole invasion. But on March 27th, we approached Okinawa and went within 6,000 yards of the beach to look around. Part of the 5th Fleet was bombarding the beach and some of the battleships were as follows. The Idaho, Nevada, Tennessee, West Virginia, Arkansas, where my buddy 
Tom Parsons was on board, and the Maryland and various other cruisers of the fifth fleet were Philadelphia, Portland, Salt Lake City, Wichita, Biloxi, and Cleveland. They bombarded the islands all day when they steamed in formation about 70 miles north of Okinawa. On March 28th, we had another air raid. A Japanese kamikaze flew over our formation and tried to suicide drive on the USS Klein, APD-120, but overshot his target and crashed just uh, uh, over their fantail. Checking the wreckage on the fantail, they were able to prove it was their guns that hit him and were credited with shooting down the plane. The battle fleet bombarded Okinawa all day and they withdrew in the evening. All APDs were assigned to screen the transports, troop ships. We had two more air raids that night. But after we did that one night with all the battleships in the evening, they would go out to sea. And when we did that, all of a sudden, we were hit by a bunch of kamikazes looking for the APDs. And the next day, the battleship Commodore said, you're not going to be with us from now on. You attract too much attention. Wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> on March 30th, at 0730, while approaching Okinawa from our night station, we were directed to go to the assistance of the LSM 188, which sent out a distress signal, a kamikaze leaving three dead and 12 badly wounded and 10 other casualties hit her at 0610. Many of the bodies were mangled and torn beyond recognition. The Lloyd came to the rescue giving medical help and much of our damage control equipment. After fighting the fire for some time, we were able to save the ship and take the survivors to the hospital ship. Later in the morning, after the fleet had been bombarding the island most of the morning, our UDT went in with five or six other teams to blow up their targets. Besides their regular gear, they only carried 50 pounds of explosives on their backs. All teams worked together, and by noon, 10 miles of beach were blown sky high. The operation was a success, and our team arrived safely back aboard without any casualties. Little did we know we would have another air raid that night. Wow, what were the feelings of everybody at this time? I think we were getting a little tired. I just can't imagine what it was like to be up at all hours and constantly yeah. alert and afraid. Or You keep getting attacked all during the day, and then just about the time you go to bed, all of a sudden you hear... Gun shooting and the alarm going off. It's like living in a in a constant state of fear. That's definitely or fight truth. or flight. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's not too good. And on top of that, when you're laying in your in your rack, your bed, and with all that shooting, all that asbestos is falling down on your Mattress. You most of the time your bed is covered up with a canvas, but then you take the canvas open and you're laying there, and then the alarm goes, and you go to the battleship, and then you come back, and by that time all this asbestos is from all the firing. The asbestos falls in your bed, and then you're crawling and sleeping in it. I just can't even imagine what it was like to go to sleep 
with all that noise outside. Well, you get used to it. And you get tired enough that you can sleep anytime. I'm sure. <laughs> wow. Once again, on March 31st, the fleet bombarded the beach all day long. Many planes from the carrier forces bombed the island and strafed the beaches. We withdrew that night and steamed with the Western Attack Group 30 miles west of Okinawa. So where were you headed? That was just for the night. But the next morning was April 1st, Easter Sunday, and time for the invasion. Wow. Can you tell us a little bit about what the what it was like to be a part of that invasion? We returned to Okinawa with the invasion force and were attacked at 0645 by three Japanese planes. Almost every ship present fired at on them, including us. The first two planes were shot down immediately. The third plane, a dive bomber, dropped two bombs very close to the cruiser USS Philadelphia, and men were shot down. The plane crashed near one of our ship boats, and they salvaged part of the landing gear and brought it aboard. Souvenirs! <laughs> At zero, 0830, the first wave of troops hit the beach, supported by the naval guns of our battleships and from 300 to 400 carrier planes. They were approximately 1,400 ships included in invasion force. Our boat crews of our underwater demolition team led the first waves of the troops onto the beach. Wow. So you were crucial in that. I understand that most of the ships were anchored in the bay. How did you guys go undetected uh, during air raids? There were hundreds of ships anchored in the bay of Okinawa, and a lot of ships had smoke generators on their fantails to ensure discretion. When we knew there was going to be an air raid, they announced over the TBS voice radio between ships to make smoke. When all ships turned on their smoke generators, the whole anchorage was covered. Although incoming enemy planes could not see us, we could see them with a, our radar. We avoided doing that because if we started firing at them, they took the risk of giving our direction away. Oh, wow. That wasn't good. Well, that's a pretty interesting tactic to pr yeah. smoke screen. Yeah. So I understand that the underwater demolition team, or the UDT, was really implemental in a lot of... Um, the securing of the beaches. Can you tell me a little bit more about what their job was like? Uh, yeah. We had secured from general quarters at 1930, and everything was quiet until our underwater demolition team touched off 20 tons of TNT at the stroke of midnight. The blast cleared out the reefs along the beaches, so our landing craft could land safely. That was one of the jobs they were supposed to be doing. And that's pretty important. Yeah. Did you ever cross paths with any other branches of military? Yeah. <clears throat> one time, uh, the planes hit ahead of us and dove into the battleship West Virginia, hitting her on the port side. At 1945, a boat came alongside with six Marines and a Cochrane. Their ship left without them and didn't come back until morning. So we picked them up and fed them and sent them on their way. My goodness, you are quite the hospitable ship. 
Always. <laughs> I understand that you were out in the firing line. What was that like day to day? Well, there's one day at 0540, two Japanese planes attacked us and were both shot down, and one of them fell just astern of us. By the 0700, we were anchored in the bay just off Okinawa. We got underway at 1700 and proceeded to our night station, which was on the outer screen. However, at 1840, five Japanese planes attacked us. We shot down four, and the other made a suicide dive, directly hitting the USS Dickerson APD-21. The dive started a huge fire and two explosions. The total man lost wasn't set at that time because they were still looking for survivors. That's sort of the way things kept going. Oh day to day. No wonder the Battle of Okinawa is nicknamed the Typhoon of Steel. So in war, things don't always go as planned. Yeah, because the uh, plans were to let us know what was happening. Sometimes they would announce what the conditions were. And a lot of times they'd say, flash red, control yaw, which meant when their planes arrive, they're all enemies, so you can shoot at anything. But one day... And, and that's a combined thing, flash red, control yellow. They're not two separate ideas. That's right. Okay. Yeah. We, uh... What went wrong that one day? Well, we were firing at a bunch of planes that went over, and we were, a lot of ships were flying, uh, firing at them, and then all of a sudden it was quiet. But a few minutes later, two more planes flew over. And everyone fired. It was too late. By the time the planes were identified as friendly, later as one TBF Avenger and one F4F Wildcat, quite a few fellas felt bad about this terrible mistake. They were both shot down and their pilots were dead. Our ship only fired a few shots because we saw they were friendly soon enough. This started quite an argument, and many of the fires claimed they shouldn't have flown over the ships because of its control yellow. That meant we could fire at anything. So that was a bad day. Wow. Yeah, you don't often hear stories of friendly fire go gone wrong. How would you have known if they were friendly planes? Well, any time they reported we might have an air raid is intimate, but don't fire unless you're sure it's enemy, because friendly planes were also in the same area. Flash red, control yellow, meant that an air raid was imminent and we could fire at anything in the air because there were no friendly planes in the area. So there you can tell the difference. So the, the friendly planes is flash red, control green. Yeah. And, and shoot at anything is flash red, control yellow. Right. That's right. Interesting. But who always listened to that? Yeah. I... After doing it day after day, why, you can get a little confused. And you'll shoot at anything to stay alive. Yeah. If something's moving, you shoot at it. <laughs> and that's when we got hit. <clears throat> as soon as we heard some shooting, a lot of guys dropped down on the deck. Yeah. <clears throat> And before that, it was just a big show. When somebody was shooting, 
who got hit yet? Wow. <laughs> who got hit next? <laughs> and then things changed yeah. once it happened to you. Yeah. So the USS Lloyd was typically anchored in the harbor, but did you anchor anywhere else? We were often uh, sent out on stations on the perimeter around the harbor, which was 20 or 30 miles out. But we weren't always there, and sometimes we'd move in closer, and we'd have to be careful where we anchored if we got too close, because the enemy had boats that they'd sneak out at night to where the ships were anchored, and they had uh, bombs that they could paste to the side of the ship that would, they, could, they could blow them up and damage the ship. And often they would also climb up the anchor chain at night while everybody's sleeping and go around killing a lot of sailors that are sleeping. Wow. But once we found out about that, when we anchored in close, we had a special guard all night by the anchor chain. And one night, they started climbing up the chain. But as soon as they reached the deck, they were dead. Wow. <laughs> they weren't going to get you in your sleep. They didn't. That didn't work for them. They didn't have a chance. <laughs> Aside from the constant fear of attack, there was some good news that came about. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was? Yes, I can. Later in the morning, our captain made a very nice speech, which we were all glad to hear. He announced that the Carrier Task Force 58 had sunk the prize of the Japanese, which were the 45,000-ton battleship, the Yamada. It suffered eight torpedo hits and eight large bomb hits. In addition, there were two cruisers and three destroyers sunk or damaged, and three more were left burning, although they escaped. The group was attacked southeast of Japan and was heading towards Okinawa. Apparently, the Japanese had a big plan to throw everything at us to stop the invasion of Okinawa. The Carrier Task Force 58 also announced they shot down 1,500 Japanese planes in the past seven weeks. On April 6th, they shot down 236 planes alone, and 182 Japanese planes got through to Okinawa and attacked American ships. Of those 182 planes, 22 of them made successful suicide attacks and 116 others were shot down by our ships and planes. That was a very good score and it made everyone glad to hear it. The captain also congratulated all hands on the way we had conducted ourselves during those past harrowing days. Whoopee! <laughs> <laughs> oh, after being a part of such a traumatic <laughs> experience, it's, it's not surprising that you take it lightly at this point. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, yippee at 91, you are still around to tell the tale. Well, the battle is not over yet. There is still more to come. And we will pick up here on next week's episode of the Ping Jockey Podcast. This is Marley and Mr. Fiddler, a.k.a. the Ping Jockey, signing off. Bye-bye. <laughs>